This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. So, um, previously on dogmatic theology with Philip Neary, we looked, we've looked at the father and his relation to our priesthood and the son and his relation to our priesthood. In my first talk, I propose to you that there is a, a loose sense in which we are conformed through our priesthood to the person of the father. Namely, we are through our priesthood, spiritual fathers, spiritual begetters. And in that sense, we are like the father who is the begetter within the Godhead. And yet our priesthood more properly and more precisely and more perfectly conforms us to the person of Jesus Christ because within the divinity, it's the son who is the principled principle and the father is the unprincipled principle. And so our priesthood, if we reflect on that, is really first and foremost something akin to the divinity of the son, right? It is not first and foremost a sacrifice that we make. It's not first and foremost something that we give. It is first and foremost something that we receive. It is a gift from on high in our lives and in our persons. So in my second talk, we I wanted to delve more deeply into our conformity to the person of Jesus Christ in and through our priesthood. And there we saw that Christ's priesthood first is located in his humanity and that Christ's humanity is located in his person, where it exists in perfect harmony with his divinity. And I suggested that that might encourage us to think about how Christ can be a model for balancing and integrating our priestly character with our human nature in the integrity of our persons, right? So just as Jesus Christ is one divine person with whole and complete and perfect human nature, whole and complete and perfect divine nature that are nevertheless harmoniously integrated within his person. So too, each one of us as sacramental priests should strive for a, a complete and integrated priesthood within our person, along with a complete, robust, mature humanity. Today, what I want to do is turn to the last but not least of the three divine persons, the Holy Spirit. And in particular, I want to think about what implications there might be for our practical living out of our priesthood with respect to the doctrine of the filioque. So I promised this uh, to somebody who asked a question about the filioque earlier. Um, now is the payoff time. So in this talk, I'm, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to prove the filioque. Um, so I'm going to prove that um, Jesus Christ is in his very person, the spirit sender, right? It's not, that is not an accident that it's not something that accrues to him um, just merely in virtue of his human nature being a priest of a particular kind, anointed by the Father. It, no, his very person is to be the spirit sender. Then, once we've proven that, I'm going to consider some, not, not by any means exhaustively, but some titles of the Holy Spirit who is sent by the Son. And then I want to reflect on what all of that might mean for our identity as priests. So first, proving the filioque. I want to begin with the caveat. Um, and the caveat is this. Um, and I say this for, for any of our Eastern Rite brethren who might listen to this talk. So the caveat. Um, everything that I'm about to say is perfectly consistent with a Catholic Orthodox um, understanding of the Son that could be articulated as follows. Uh, the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. 
Here's why I think that's a perfectly acceptable, for, um, well, so it's a perfectly acceptable formula because the fathers use it, um, but it is a perfectly acceptable substitute formula for what we in the West mean by the filioque, just so long as you hold two things in mind. Um, first, in, in the stricter formula from the father through the son, the from means not just from as from a principle, but from as from an unprincipled principle. And through means what we in the West would say, would call from, with the added, with the added specification, through means from a principle that is principled. So we've already seen that within the divinity, the father is the unprincipled principle and the son is the principled principle. So if you want to restrict the meaning of the word from to designate the procession from an unprincipled principle, and you want to restrict the word through to mean procession from a principled principle, then everything that I'm going to say about the filioque is perfectly captured in precise technical theological language um, by the formula from the father through the son, uh, fr through the son. Nevertheless, I like the Western formula, which is ex filioque procedit, right? So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son. And the reason I like it is because when we use that formula, the word from doesn't need to be hyper-specialized. Um, it doesn't need to be, it, you know, it can mean just what we kind of ordinarily mean by from, uh, which is proceeding from a source, right? Um, so caveat done, now let's prove the filioque. Remember our Thomistic principles for Trinitarian theology. We just got two of them, right? The simplicity principle and the opposition principle. The simplicity principle says everything in God is God. And the opposition principle says in God, two things are really distinct if and only if they are mutually opposed. So all we need to prove the filioque are those two principles and revelation. And I take it that we all agree uh, that revelation asserts there is a spirit, the spirit is God, and the spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. Right? If you deny that there is a spirit, you're just simply not a Christian. You don't accept what all Christians accept through revelation. If you deny that the spirit is God, you are not a Christian, right? Might be an Aryan, right? But you're not a Christian. And if you deny that the Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son, you're not a Christian, right? That's just to deny the Holy Trinity, right? And the core mysteries of our faith are the Trinity and the Incarnation. <clears throat> so, bless you. With those as our starting points, let's prove the filioque. First, if there's a Spirit, there must be a spirator, right? If there's a breath, there must be a breather. And we know that just by considering the meaning of the word breath or spirit. A breath is just what comes out of the mouth of a breather, right? Um, a spirit is just the thing that is spirated by someone. So if there's a spirit, there must be a spirator. But we know from Revelation there is a spirit. So we know there must be a spirator. Now, apply the simplicity principle. Everything in God is God. In God, there is a spirator, so the spirator is God. Now, um, ask yourself, is the spirator opposed to the Father? Is there anything in the notion of a spirator that sets itself in opposition? to the notion of father. No, and that would be evident, just look at the ideas. So by application of the opposition principle, that means that the father is the spirator, right? Because the opposition principle says in God, two things are really distinct if and only if they're mutually opposed. But father and spirator are not mutually opposed, so father and spirator are not mutually distinct. But wait, what about spirator and son? 
Are those mutually opposed? No. There's nothing in the notion of son, right, one who is begotten, that's, that excludes the idea of breathing forth a spirit. And there's nothing in the notion of breathing forth a spirit that precludes being begotten. So, spirator and son are not mutually opposed. Apply the opposition principle. That means the son is the spirator. But if the father is the spirator and the son is the spirator, then we now have two notions of spirator. Apply the opposite, call them spirator one and spirator two. Apply the opposition principle. Is there anything in the notion of spirator one that is opposed to the notion of spirator two? No, it's just the same notion, right? It's just the notion of spirator applied in two different cases. So if there's no mutual opposition between those two notions, then there can be no real distinction, which means the father and the son are not really distinct spirators. And that is simply to assert that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son as from a single principle. And that is the Western dogma of the filioque. So I just proved it for you, right? All the, the proof, if, if you want the formal expression of the proof, I can give you the formal expression of the proof. It's valid. Um, all of the premises either are data of revelation um, or one of the two Thomistic principles of Trinitarian theology. Um, so if you agree that the, the simplicity principle is true, the opposition principle is true, and there is a spirit, then you must, must believe the filioque. Um, now, here's the important thing. Um, the filioque means that who the son is, is the spirator, right? Just as the father really is the spirator in his very person, so to the son in his very person is the spirator, which means that Jesus Christ, before the world was born, is the spirit sender. To, to think of Jesus as the sender of the spirit is to adequately and accurately grasp who the eternal word is. So if the eternal word, the son to whom we are properly conformed in our priestly character, if the son is the spirit sender, um, then I submit to you, that's going to have very important implications for us as priests. Before I get to that, I want to say just a few things about this spirit who is sent, right? Um, God, the Holy Spirit himself, right? Because in, in exactly the same way that who it is that sends the spirit is both father and son, um, so too, an accurate grasp of who it is that is spirated, so who the Holy Spirit is, requires us to understand him as being eternally connected to the Son, right? Not just eternally proceeding from the Father, but eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son as one principle, right? If we don't grasp that the Holy Spirit in his very person proceeds eternally from the Son, we fail to understand who the Holy Spirit is. So, who is the Holy Spirit? What can we say about him? Um, it's always good to start with the creed. So, and uh, as I said, I'm not going to try to go into an exhaustive list of the, the titles and uh, proper names of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'm just cherry picking here. I'm picking out things that suit my ultimate purposes. So I want to start with uh, the way the creed starts. The Holy Spirit, we call him Lord and giver of life. Lord and giver of life. And I think that formula is actually very striking when we think of it in light of the, the proper name, Holy Spirit, right? What does the word holy 
mean there? I submit it means he's Lord. Right? When we call, when we say, when we distinguish the Holy Spirit from all other spirits, right, we're distinguishing him as the divine spirit, the spirit who is Lord. Right? Um, Father Andrew mentioned the, the Trisagion, the thrice holy acclamation, right? Um, holy God, holy Lord, holy immortal one, right? Um, it notice that the common denominator there is holy. Right? So if there's anything that picks out God that picks out the Lord, it's his holiness. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, that word holy designates for us his lordship, his divinity. And then spirit, literally, right, it means breath. But breath is connected to life, right? Things that are alive, characteristically, are alive just so long as they have breath, right? And we euphemistically talk about um, death as, you know, taking your last breath, giving up your breath, giving up the spirit, as scripture says of Christ on the cross. So Holy Spirit and Lord giver of life seem to have a very deep, profound connection, right? Um, the Holy Spirit is the Lord insofar as he's holy, um, and he's giver of life insofar as he is the very breath of God, right? He is the very life breath of the Trinity. So we've got Lord and giver of life. We also have the titles spirit of truth and comforter. And it's striking to me that they're uh, frequently connected in the scriptures. So um, first spirit of truth, just on its own. This is from John 16. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. <clears throat> Let's consider that passage in light of the filioque right? If everything we've just said is true, right? If who the Holy Spirit is, is the one who proceeds from Father and Son, and who the Son is, is the one who, with the Father as a single principle, breathes forth the Spirit, then this passage takes on a new and important meaning, right? So the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own authority, Right? Remember that language of authority and authorship that we talked about within the Trinity. Um, the Father alone has is the author of the Son. The Father and the Son together are author of the Spirit. And so the Spirit never speaks on his own authority as if the Spirit's authority were something separate from the authority of the Father and the, and the authority of the Son. And even more importantly for the filioque, notice what comes next, right? Um, the Holy Spirit will, uh, will declare to you the things that are to come. How? He will glorify me. This is Jesus speaking. The Spirit will glorify me, and he will take from what is mine, and declare it to you, right? Just as the Son receives all that he has and all that he is from the Father who begets him, so too the Spirit receives all that he has and all that he is from the Father and the Son who spirate him, right? He takes from what is mine and declares it to you. Right? This passage is certainly speaking about the economy of salvation, but if we have an adequate understanding of the filioque, we understand it's also teaching us about the inner life of the Trinity itself. Here's John 14. Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, 
for he dwells with you and will be in you. So here, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father and the Son as a single principle, is now named the Comforter. And he's the Comforter because he reveals the truth to us and dwells within us. Right? He doesn't dwell within the world. He's not recognized by the world. But he is recognized by those who are united to the Son. Why? Because the Son is the Spirit Center. It's impossible for us to be united to the one who in his very person eternally uh, eternally spirates the spirit and not have that spirit that he breathes forth dwell in us. Also from John 14. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So over and over and over again in scripture, we see the Holy Spirit depicted as connected both to the Father and to the Son, as proceeding both from the Father and the Son. And precisely in virtue of that procession from Father and Son, He's able to reveal all truth to us. And what is truth? Truth is Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Um, The truth that is Christ is made known to us through the Holy Spirit who's given to us and dwells within us precisely because it's impossible for the Spirit to be present and the Son to be absent. Why? Because who the Spirit is is one who eternally proceeds from the Son. And who the Son is is one who eternally spirates the spirit. So we've got Lord and giver of life. We've got spirit of truth communicating um, the truth who is Jesus Christ and the comforter, right? The consoler who dwells within us and gives us the peace from on high. And the last title that I want to consider is the spirit of adoption. So here we're moving from John to Paul. So in Romans 8, St. Paul says, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with your spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Here again, notice the deep, inextricable connection between the gift of the spirit, who is the spirit of adoption, by which we are made sons, right? Um, And it's very clear here that we're not made sons of the father as if that were kind of circumventing Jesus, right? We become sons of the father only because the spirit of adoption unites us to the Son, capital S, right? We become sons of the eternal Father only through our union with Christ, and we are only united in Christ through the spirit of adoption, right? The Son, the eternal Son, the eternal Word, is Son by nature. We are not, but we do become sons by grace. How? through receiving the Spirit who is sent by Father and Son together, right? When the Spirit who proceeds eternally from the Son is received in our heart and our soul, he makes us like the Son from whom he proceeds. And that's the spirit of adoption. So, the Holy Spirit is Lord and giver of life. The Holy Spirit is spirit of truth. He's the comforter, and he's the spirit of adoption. And I cherry picked those particular titles because I think they give us a sense of the way in which the spirit himself is fruitful in the economy of salvation. So insofar as we think of the Holy Spirit under the title Lord and giver of life, we can see him as the source of all grace, particularly of sanctifying grace. Lord and giver of life is the, is the wellspring, the fountain 
welling up within us unto eternal life, and that is sanctifying grace. When we think of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth, we can see him uniquely as the source of all faith. When we think of the Holy Spirit under the title of the Comforter, he becomes the source of hope. And finally, when we think of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption, he becomes the source of familial love, right? It's only by being adopted into the family that is the Holy Trinity that we can finally experience the love that we long for, right? Um, this morning we had a talk on Augustine, so it's fitting, right? Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, right? It's only the love of the Trinity that gives us peace. And so when we consider the spirit as the spirit of adoption, right? The spirit by whom we actually enter into that perfect family of not just unconditional love, but eternal and infinite love, um, there we see him as the source of charity. Okay, so... What does this have to do with the practical living out of our priesthood? Well, I've said that our priesthood conforms us to the person of Jesus Christ. I've said that Jesus Christ is in his very person, the spirit center. Which means our priesthood conforms us to the spirit center. And I think that means that every act of our priesthood, every Per se, proper act of our priesthood is ordered towards the sending of the Holy Spirit in the world. That means that every act of our priesthood is ordered towards the sending of the Lord and giver of life, the source of all grace. Every act of our priestly ministry is ordered towards the sending of the Spirit of truth, who is the source of all faith. <clears throat> Every act of our priesthood is ordered towards the sending of the Comforter, who is the source of all hope. And every act of our priesthood is ordered towards the sending of the Spirit of Adoption, who is the source of all love. And those are not many spirits, but one spirit. Which means we can't give the spirit of truth to the people that God has commended into our care, unless we also give the comforter. It's impossible for us to genuinely send forth the comforter without breathing forth the spirit of truth. Right? For us to act well as priests is for us to breathe forth the Holy Spirit for our people. And that means that whenever we act as priests, we cannot separate the truth of the faith from the promise of hope. We cannot separate the promise of hope from the reality of love. We cannot separate the call to love from the state of sanctifying grace. As priests, we are instruments of that sanctifying grace in the divine economy. And that means that wherever we act as priests, there should be ascending forth of the spirit that results in an increase of faith, hope, and love. So whether we're in the confessional or at the altar, whether we're blessing a house or visiting the sick, if we're living out our priesthood well, a sign of that should be the identifiability of the spirit in that work. And if the spirit's there, then the whole of the faith, will be made present. The whole of the Christian life will be made present. The integrity of our call will be realized. We will teach the truth. We will comfort the sorrowful. We will give love to people. And we will do all of that in the context of an invitation to live the life of grace that is the life of our faith. 
So we can think about the various functions of our priesthood. Remember, St. Thomas identifies the three functions of um, giving divine things to God's people, offering the prayers of the people up to God, and reconciling the people with God. Now we can think of all three of those functions as um, as having a, a deeply spiritual character in the proper sense of being characterized by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the sending of the Holy Spirit, right? When we administer the sacraments, right? When we just bestow divine things through our priestly ministry, that's got to be a sending of the Spirit. When we gather the prayers and the intentions, the troubles and the needs of our people in our prayer and offer them up, to the Lord, that's got to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when, particularly in the confessional, when we reconcile people to the Father, that's going to be done only through the gift of the Spirit. Which means that the measure of my fidelity as a priest is how much do I breathe forth the Spirit when I perform my role. It's easy for me to hold back the spirit, to begrudgingly engage in the work of the priesthood. But if I embrace the gift that I have received from on high as a participation in the priesthood of Christ, in the person of Christ, through which the Holy Spirit will constantly be sent forth into the world through me, frail, fragile, weak, and limited as I am, I will rejoice in that gift. I will embrace my identity and I will give myself with renewed effort to this beautiful and glorious vocation. And I pray that the same will be true of you.